Aloha, everyone. In all the cool places you are, or hot, <laughs> or late, or early. Hello. Good to see you all. Wow, it's so amazing. Yay. <laughs> hmm. You might take the time to see everyone. Uh, so wonderful. Oh, hello, hello. <laughs> hey. Wow, a million miles. Even Quebec. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. You know, the range of all of us from Australia to Japan to Quebec to Canada, it's amazing, really. North America <laughs> can never get used to it. Mm. So a lot of you on here did one or more of the month of weekends or a weekend in a week or two weeks or the whole month. And uh, now we're back to our regular Sunday program, sitting together, a talk, some question and answer period afterwards. So it's nice to uh, nice to see you all together, all the range of yogis, all the colors. So I'm I'm thinking of a couple of qualities to keep in mind for this meditation. I'll give you a little short instruction and then there'll be the silence. But just to learn more about our chitta, our heart, mind, consciousness, with the mindful awareness and, and clearly comprehending the various dhammas, natures, the different states that come up, whether they're hindrances, awakening qualities, wandering mind, focused mind, settled, curious. In particular, I just want to suggest, no, notice where the habit of self-referencing whatever natures appear you know, a memory, an emotion, a mental state, and, and how we self-reference it into our narrative. Immediately kind of story make, um, sensations and the story about if it's pleasant or unpleasant or what part of the body, uh, um, what it might be connected to, how we might adjust fix and so forth, you know, suddenly we're into a, 
self-centered mind state, the story-making mind state, just try and notice that. Just try and see and see what happens the moments where when we see it clearly, mindfully, it falls away. We just see the, the nature as it is, the sensation, the emotion, the memory, the thought patterns as it is and, and drop the embellishment, the fabrication that continues to solidify or congeal that sense of, you know, I, I making me, me, me. Look for that. And secondly, You know, anchoring somewhere in the body, like around the solar plexus, around the heart center, some place in the body that's familiar, safe, connected. Appreciating and feeling the care, the, com the compassion the sensitivity to our, to the delicacy of the heart, the vulnerability of it, from being open, from being curious, from doing the meditation, whether we've been meditating some of you for the month or just here on the Sunday, on the Sunday sit. You know, and from that anchored grounded place, say it's the solar plexus or the breath, using that investigation of Dhamma's that second awakening factor, just recognize that most of what appears is not what it seems. Unless there's that very fine frequency of the present and we are just with the as it is nature of sensations appearing, motion, thought patterns, memories coming and going. If we're in that place, then we're doing it. If we're not in that place, it's helpful to remind ourselves that what we see is not as it appears, particularly when it's a, a memory we're latched onto or a projection in the future or a judgment, self-judgment. That helps us let go of, of the story kind of connecting to the anatta nature that can't control anything. And anyway, most of what is arising is at least partially delusion. Just staying present, mindful until the story peels away and it's just the body as it is with its textures and changing temperatures, vibrations, and pressure, or the emotion moment, what its flavor, what the characteristic is, that it's uncontrollable, that it's not anything to identify with or attach to and that it's continuously appearing and disappearing, not the same emotion two moments in a row, not the same thought formation two micro moments in a row. Just dropping in then to that, that 
that level of the suchness of things, the as it is nature of things. It breaks that um, capacity of the delusion dhamma, the delusion nature, creating a false reality. appearances that aren't real. So we're not just leaving it at that and then coming back, well, what is real? It's the immediate personal felt sense experience. Textures of the earth element, vibrations, firmness, pressures, the body as it really is. And those emotive moments that are part physical sensation, part thought formation, and the, the mental emotional mood itself that has a certain fragrance or flavor, characteristic like sensations, emotions can be hard or soft, somewhere in between. They can be fluid or cohesive, hot or cold. All this discovery can be, you don't have to move from being anchored in the breath or anchored at the solar plexus. It can be right there. Not the sense of going out there somewhere to see where that I making process is. It's right here just old habit and it drops away more often than we think. You don't have to go anywhere to stay with what is real, true, the immediacy of the elements, mental moods, emotions. One full breath can show us all of this. See for yourself, see what's true, what feels real, everything else. No need to hold on to.
Thank you, Stephen, for the instructions and sitting. Uh, I owe um, a lot to a Japanese Buddhist monk poet, Saigyo, who became a Buddhist monk when he was 23 years old. And he lived from 1118 to 1190. There's a, a historian named, um, well, actually, he was a professor of Japanese um, studies and religious studies, William Loeffler. Uh, he said that Saigyo lived at a time that was like a dying end of a glorious era, that it was like they were stumbling into the night of extinction, but that Saigyo's contemporaries refused to see it. which was partially um, why he decided to become a monk um, at 23. And when we um, just finished a month of the four foundations of mindfulness, mindfulness of body, kaya, kaya nupasana, but mindfulness of feelings, vedana nupasana, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feelings mental feelings, not emotions, mindfulness of chitta, chitta nupasana, mindfulness of consciousness and all the colors of consciousness of knowing. And then uh, the dhamma, dhamma nupasana, mindfulness of dhammas, which includes uh, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, consciousness, as well as the seven factors of enlightenment, five hindrances, four noble truths, five aggregates. Uh, um, so if you're wondering about Dhamma Nupasana, it really includes everything um, that isn't mentioned in the first three. And we were um, offering the four foundations as all aspects of nature. And one of the um, things that always affected me deeply about Segeo, his poems, was how, um, how deeply immersed he was in nature on that level of being with things just as they are. And, and you can see in the um, unfolding of his poetry, uh, the way in which um, when he would use the word Japanese word tomo, um, using it as companion, he came to use that word companion for um, aspects of nature that were unusual at that time. So companion was a cricket or the sound of water or loneliness or melancholy. It was like his, his range of how he um, became companions, but with that sense of wisdom and um, awe, with, with so many aspects of life. And in the period that he lived as it was passing, uh, it was shifting to a, the samurai time and the warrior, warlike, much more warlike time. It was um, at that point when he took birth, the, the Buddhist understanding of impermanence of anicca, that all things, um, all conditioned things are arising and passing away. The understanding of Anicca was very soft 
it was like the an image, a very favorite image at that time would be an autumn leaf, a red autumn leaf that would uh, maybe a red autumn maple leaf that would um, fall, let go from the tree. Very that that sound of the leaf letting go, the edge of the stem letting go and gradually kind of floating and drifting down and touching the earth and landing there, that that was the understanding of Anicca. It was nature in that way. It was very consoling. It was a consoling understand, understanding of nature. It was comforting. It was benign. And in this shift um, at his, in his early life and and after it, um, nature started to present itself as floods and earthquakes. Really, it was like a big shift in, in nature. Um, a lot of um, wars, earthquakes, floods. Uh, and that they, this, this because of such drastic change, um, this is the, 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 his contemporaries couldn't bear it. They couldn't face this change, not only in nature, but also in the politics or that their lives, the culture, it was a big shift. So nature became instead of like this comforting, benign um, presence in terms of our understanding of a nature, it became more of a rupturing and devastating uh, way of understanding nature. And yet Seigo, Seigyo uh, really searched for something much deeper than those two poles of understanding of change. Oh, <laughs> so there's a poem I wanted to read. Um, Sometimes he would write a little sentence or two before the poem. And this one, he said, at a, at a point in time when I was feeling desolate, I heard the voice of a cricket very close to my pillow. So this is the poem. At that turning point, with my head for the last time pillowed in sagebrush, I would have this chirping insect still be what's closest to me. You know, this is, this is hard to even talk about. It's so beautiful, but it's just a sense that like when, when he, when he died, he wanted, he was so close to this cricket this companionship was so deep. This is who he wanted to be with him when he died. This was uh, wrote, written after a storm. The sound of water gets to be my sole comfort in this lonely battered hut. In the midst of mountain storms, fury drops drip in the holes and silences. So you see, he was coming to terms with the way that uh, Nietzsche was presenting itself, right? He, he became um, so deeply connected to the storm that the sound of the water, the sound of the drips and the holes within the silences were again the, the companion, his companion. And lastly, just to make sure your understanding why I um, learned so much from him in my early years of practice. He said in this poem, hoped for, looked for guests, just never made it to my mountain hut. 
the now congenial loneliness I would hate to live without. To have such a deep connection with loneliness that he couldn't bear to live without it. And again, loneliness, what is a chitta nupasana, right? A, a mind state, emotional place that we all, it's a landscape we learn to connect with and notice its impermanence, right? And be with, but, but yeah, this is a, remember this is <laughs> 1118 to 1190 he lived and here's this emotional range as well as this deep understanding of how to be with the difficult aspects of nature how to be free in it so we're born into as a being on the planet, uh, this range of joy and sorrow in the world. And this is so important. We're born into this vast range of joy and sorrow in this world. And it's so vast. And if we just consider the last week, never mind the last weeks or the, the past year or the past few years or a lifetime, a, our lifetime we hopefully start to understand our spiritual journey as one of, of not only finding peace and learning to access peace, but really cultivating it. And, and finding, for example, loving kindness, unconditional love, unconditional peace, the equanimity, unconditional love, the metta, the choiceless love, not the, that we can, when we understand that that is the spiritual journey, then when we live at a time like we live in, where obviously things are unraveling, they're unraveling at a pace that a lot of us find difficult and hard to find meaning in. But when we put it in the context of facing turbulence, right? And, and understanding catastrophe or the heart, heartbreaking aspects of any kind of suffering. Um, then we can, we can see this time and especially um, as it kind of accelerates, I think this is so important to see that we can dig deeper that it's not a time to go, oh no, it's getting too hard. It's a time to go, oh no, it's getting hard, but it's time to dig deeper. It's time to get stronger. It's time to put in more effort to step up to the plate. Which I'm not saying is easy but I'm saying is essential. This morning I saw a photo on, in the news um, from Louisiana from the aftermath of Hurricane, Hurricane Ida, a woman holding um, a little squirrel that she had rescued in her hand and it was all curled up and sleeping and it looked so rescued, <laughs> you know, it looks so peaceful. Uh, and I feel like it's really important for all of us to tune into finding that attunement to all the ways so many people have been trying to help in the face of all the things that are happening just important to find find that those stories so many people are are acting so kindly and compassionately again and not to not to avoid the 
uh, so much unnecessary suffering that's happening and uh, it's kind of staggering in a way. So the finding the beauty and kindness in the tragedy is so important in our spiritual practice. I did my first Vipassana retreat in 1975. You know, that's a long time ago, it seems. 1975, um, it was a two week retreat. I was 24 years old, I'll be 70 soon. And I, I remember um, even when I was 12 or 13, I, I could see things were gonna unravel. In, a, in our world in the way that it is now. Um, and I know when I, I started practicing and I, I started to understand a bit, just a teeny bit that the Vipassana practice was really starting to uh, pay attention to endings, like the ending of the breath or the ending of a step not just the beginning, but the endings, to include the endings. And it was just this deep glimpse of like, oh, we need this. Not just I need this personally, but our culture needs it, the planet needs it. Like, it's just like this, this where are we gonna find the strength to be with this global situation? Well, if you can be with the end of a breath, you can be with the end of your life, right? You can be with the anything. If you understand it, there's peace. And there's so much in these practices of the Brahma Viharas, the loving kindness, the compassion, the empathetic joy, the equanimity, the, these ways in which we are nurtured and supported to not just be unconditionally peaceful, but and to keep bringing that energy of calm and peace into the world. Um, as there's so much anxiety with all the uncertainty, there's that, what a gift. People wonder what they can do, but what about being able to be peaceful and offering that, being able to be kind in whatever way we are able to in our lives. So if we can take care of our own anxiety, for example, and notice it appear and disappear, right? Just like Sega with the loneliness, um, then we can help anybody with anything, etc. I have a, a friend the other day that it was needing some support, um, kind of calling for some support that I could tell. It was needing something um, creative and uh, I suggested she find um, Richie Havens singing uh, Freedom at the beginning of Woodstock. Uh, and I have, I was not there. Um, I have a dear friend that wanted me to go, but even then I was more of the psycho type, <laughs> not, not the, or the recluse type, not the go be with a million people and, you know, whatever, how many people were there. But um, I was happy she was going. In fact, she was on the cover of Time Magazine uh, as a person um, attending the festival. Um, and so that the song Freedom um, and the the aspect of it, he repeats freedom so many times the word and then that, that there's also 
sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Yeah, sometimes I feel like a motherless child. It's an old, old African-American spiritual song. And I didn't know what was going on for Richie Havens when he did this song as much as any of us can know at this point in time. But because I was looking for it to share to share with my friend, um, I learned a lot more about what happened for him. And um, he wasn't that well known a singer at that point. And they had because of that, they put him first in terms of this whole long festival. Um, and it turned out that the people that were supposed to play after him, for example, Santana or other people, couldn't make it. Like the, um, there was so much traffic, things were so backed up that they kept asking him to keep playing because none of them were, were there, could get there. And he played for three hours, three hours. He was supposed to do like one song, three hours. They keep making, he keeps turning to see if anybody's gonna <laughs> bail him out. He plays for three hours and they want him to keep playing. And he's sitting there just like, He's run out of songs. He can't think of anything to play. And he looks out at everybody and he's so moved. He just takes the time to look at everybody. And what came to his mind, his heart was the word freedom. And he, he said, when he looked out like that and had that thought come, he said, they can't hide us anymore. There's so many of us. We can't be hidden anymore. And the song came out of him. That was so moving that it became like the anthem of that festival and that time period, freedom, right? Freedom. And I was very moved to read that uh, when he died, he, he wanted his ashes sprinkled there. Just like Segio wanted a cricket there. Richie Havens wanted his ashes sprinkled there. There are these places of great meaning for us where we feel free, right? Connected that we understand something, this range of being, when we feel, of course, we're feeling sometimes like a motherless child in the face of what's happening. And yet, can we find this freedom in the face of it? This is from um, the late, <laughs> late poems of Wang on she who lived. 1021 to 1086. Who also had uh, lived at a time where everything he was working for was going. It's called Parting in River Serene. Ravaged chrysanthemums blackum. Autumn wind returns and rain like the rain when early plums ripen to yellow. Hand in hand, why talk? We gaze together into grief everywhere in sight. Isn't this where mind knows itself utterly? We gaze together into grief everywhere in sight. Isn't this where mind knows itself utterly? How, how is it that we long for freedom? How is it that we don't? stay complacent. We, we need to rest. We need to rest. 
but we don't have to stay indifferent or complacent. There's this sense like, well, what is this grief? Well, if we're paying attention at all right now, there's probably some grief, right? At all. And yet the Buddha taught that grief is grief, but all aspects of connecting to pain, it's like despair. He said that it's the helplessness we feel in the face of suffering, the overwhelm we feel in the face of suffering. That's how we find compassion. That's the ticket. So if we're feeling overwhelmed in any way, um, maybe it's time to stop reading <laughs> and doing some compassion practice, right? Maybe we do, maybe we need to be doing more compassion practice these days if it's feeling too much. Maybe we need to step on the gas with compassion practice caring about pain because it's a pleasant feeling it feels good it feels good to care about pain it feels wonderful to care about pain it's a pleasant feeling the connecting with the pain often initially isn't going to be a joy ride it's usually leads us to all kinds of aspects of dukkha yeah it's you know it's like the heart is an incredible instrument of course we hit places of anguish or anxiety uncertainty grief anger despair all of it fear um it's this is this is good it means we're alive it means we're connected to the pain but then it's like it's learning how to of course be mindful of it, to feel the body sensations, to notice the thoughts coming and going, to really relate to grief just as we would the sound of the most beautiful bird. The flow of sixth sense door awareness. There might be a few moments of body sensations, maybe some boredom, sleepiness, restlessness. Peace, 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 peace. A memory of something, grief, right? It's like there's it's like there's this flow of moment to moment sixth sense to awareness, the, the the four foundations of mindfulness. And so if grief appears or happiness, or the sound of a bird, or the sound of a weed whacker, the sound of a car. We, we learn to relate to all of these experiences equally, worthy of attention. But often where we get sort of stuck, where it starts getting bogged down, is often when things are painful and difficult. And often we need the, compa the two wings of the bird, the compassion and the equanimity the deep acceptance of it as, a, as that's what's happening right now. This pain is that's what's happening right now. And then the caring about it. And then if we need to change the channel for a while, we do change the channel for a while. Healthy distraction, we do. We, we can go to the breath, <laughs> for example. Take a walk. But remember, this poem, isn't this where the mind knows itself utterly? We often don't yearn for freedom if everything's always pleasant all the time. Just not how it works. And there's so much uh, we can, we learn from the practice. It's like we can see all the different ways our motivation works, how the different mixed motivations we can have out of, um, maybe we're motivated by fear or anxiety. Maybe we're motivated by wanting, desire. Uh, but if the mindfulness practice, we, it teaches us to pause and to wait and maybe then we can come from loving kindness or we can come from 
wisdom in our actions. And um, what we can learn over time of practice is that whatever we do, whether we sit down to sit and practice meditation or we, you know, we're meditating while we're eating or going to work or being kind with somebody, whatever we're doing, it's the teaching is that you make the full effort without attachment to the result of the effort. And what a, what a great time to be alive for that, right? It's like making the full effort. It's the right thing to do to be kind. It's the right thing to do to be compassionate. It's the right thing to do to be peaceful. The right thing to do to bring more calm, et cetera, all of this. Um, but if we're attached to the result of the effort, we're going to burn out. Because what's, what's, what's behind that effort? Wanting to control, believing we can control. Maybe it's motivated by anger. Maybe it's motivated by aversion. This is where this practice can help us be free and be motivated out of that deep um, wisdom rather than being motivated by something that will eventually cause us to doubt because we can't get our way. So the practice is, it's not that we don't want to get our way. It's not that we, we don't want to ca uh, create less suffering in the world. That's a noble thing. But it's like to, to try to control the result of the action is where I'm saying is the problem. is the issue. The same action can always look the same from the outside. If we're motivated by fear or wisdom, it might not be visible. But over time, if we keep being motivated by the aversion, we're gonna, it's gonna be visible to us that the striving it um, isn't going to work. It'll backfire. It's just like with our practice. If we sit down and we're trying to get anything or get rid of anything, what happens? It doesn't work because we can't control it. So the practice is when we come back to the, the formal practice because it keeps purifying our motivation and keeps purifying our motivation and keeps purifying the motivation so that we can keep finding this this important more than ever as Thich Nhat Hanh said there's this boat of refugees out in the open sea and who's going to be the one who knocks the boat over and who's going to be the one who writes the boat because they're strong enough and peaceful enough that they're not going to get caught in that energy field? Well, we meet, need more people on the boat, meaning the planet, that can keep writing the energy field. That's, that's the anchor. That's the oasis. That's the, that's the nunnery. That's the monastery. That's but that, that our body, mind, heart, wherever we're walking, wherever we're doing, that, that we're that, we're that calm presence. And if it's getting too bogged down, find beauty, find pleasantness, find kindness, reach out, get reassured, meditate more <laughs> formally, or get some sleep. I was told by a friend recently that um, um, she, she wrote me a little message like, I, I just don't know if I can ever be social anymore. It's, you know, with all the uh, seclusion of the pandemic. And, but she had um, a son and grandson come over uh, to visit. And then this family visited that they didn't expect. They came, they knocked on the door and came in the house. And this little boy looked up 
he saw all these people coming in and he's not used, yeah, he's not used to it. And he, he looked up and he said, I think this is, a, this was like four o'clock, four or five in the afternoon. And he looked up and he said, I have to go to bed now. <laughs> and I think that's such a good story because I think we all feel that, right? Like, you know, it's like, I, I have to go. <laughs> I have to go to bed right now. It's like five o'clock in the afternoon. It's time for a little break. But it, you got to have some humor in this and lightness and find strength in all the aspects of the ways that we can. <laughs> I'm going to finish with uh, Henry David Thoreau, his book. His journal on wildflowers. I like to read from a time of year that he's written. This is from September 14th, 1856. You can always find something beautiful. Now for the small white aster along low roads like the turnpike some of them are pink. However unexpected are these later flowers. You thought that nature had about wound up her affairs. You had seen what she could do this year and had not noticed a few weeds by the roadside or mistook them for the remains of summer flowers now hastening to their fall. You thought you knew every twig and leaf by the roadside and nothing more was, be, was to be looked for there. And now to your surprise, these ditches by the road are crowded with millions of little stars. Remember, there's always these millions of little stars to give us strength courage, motivation to be free. So let's sit for a minute and then we'll take questions. Thanks. Thanks, Jesse. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we highly recommend that song if you need a little inspiration. Or if you feel shut down because it it's a knockout. Mm. So any questions for Stephen or I about the instructions, your practice, the talk? Michelle, do you want me to call on people or are you staying? Sure, to... that'd be nice. Thanks. Okay, Richard. You could hear me? Yes. Um, this is about what Steve was saying in the beginning about how our emotions and our thoughts keep are constantly changing from moment to moment and that we misinterpret that input as somehow being me or mine or whatever. Um, but 
there there are whether it's uh, emotional or physical there there are patterns there that you know problems that i have to deal with which aren't the problems that someone else has to deal with there are you know if i have a bad heart i want the doctor to deal with my heart and not with some other issue that someone else has so how, how do we square that circle how do we both deal with the particular that's true in our case without creating some sort of illusion of self by wisdom wisdom discerns what ultimate reality is and slowly whittles away always projecting um, onto experience a story a deluded story a made up uh, a made up world and also wisdom discerns uh, with compassion, how we take care of ourselves and others in this world that we live in, in all the conventional sense. Yes, if we have a problematic heart or issue, um, we do. We want someone really good at doing the right procedure, giving us the medicine. So it's being able to live in, in this world that's largely filled with stories and uh, many people living in delusion. Uh, and the discernment also, like when you choose your doctor, you want someone uh, who can give the right treatment, who sees it as it is and is passionate about his or her work and gives the right medicine, does the right procedure, because there's many who do not, who have that skill. And there's many for whom that is just a job. So, so we use our discern, discerning mind, the wisdom that can also see reality just as it is in the moment. Uh, when we enter into the conventional reality or conventional world and go about taking care of ourselves or, other, or others or business and things as things as they seem to be. We still have to live in that world too. Uh, but we're not as deluded by it from our practice. Uh, we, we can draw on our wisdom, we can draw out our compassion, do our best in the world that's mostly mad that mostly seeing things not as they really are. So it's up to wisdom, up to wisdom and compassion. That's why we practice. Thank you.
Sun, and then Khalil, Khalil, Sun. So I have a question about delusion and ignorance. It seems to me that like delusion is the is different from ignorance. But whenever I, I ask the Sayada, they kept telling me um, Avija and Moha are the same, are they? In my understanding, yes, two different words for the same. Hmm. Even though delusion the promises uh, like Avija delusion. is not knowing. Avija is not knowing what is. Avija is the opposite of knowledge, of the knowledge that sees things as they are. Moha is uh, like a, a greed, hatred, delusion. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is the delusion the root along with greed and hatred? Lobha and uh, what's hatred, dosa, lobha, dosa, moha. And so they put the Pali, the Pali teachings language often has a different word in a different context, but it means essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. So moha more uh, for the word delusion. Um, seeing things in not the way it actually is, not being able to see that as it is nature, it's delusion. We see something else, or we overlay it with our interpretation, um, perhaps motivated by fear and desire. Uh, without delusion, there, there is no fear and desire. So there's less stories woven out of fear and out of desire as delusion um, lessens, as delusion is whittled away, then there's those clear moments of, of seeing the as it is nature of things and our, our faith, our confidence, our conviction in the Dhamma grows, gets stronger. There's a direct relationship between uh, faith and wisdom. And, and together, that's how we begin to have more moments without the delusion or without the ignorance, without the moha, without the uh, avija. So you don't need to do anything but what you're already doing, just being mindful. Every time you're really mindful, then that moha is weaker. And sometimes so incredibly present and in the moment, uh, for some moments, the delusion is more in the substratum of consciousness. That is, it's, it, it hasn't been eradicated, but it's absent enough in that moment that you're seeing clearly and, and you, you act out of wisdom and compassion. That your actions don't come out of delusion and ignorance. And that's a very important thing. That changes how we live our lives and how we relate and how we think how we communicate, speak to others, how we listen without judgment. That's all you need to know. How do we see Mr. Mira? Avijja is not knowing. <laughs> and I think and I, I the English term, like a deluded mind, is different from the ignorant mind. Say that again. I guess like for me, the English word meaning ignorant. An ignorant mind doesn't know 
but a little bit mind is like knowing wrongly. I think I understand what you're saying. Knowing wrongly is an aspect of delusion or ignorance. Mm. So like I said, it's, it's seeing something and we have a perception of it, but the, our interpretation of it isn't based in the reality of what we're experiencing, seeing, hearing, or thinking about. So that, that's the fabrication, what we call papancha, the embellishment or fabrication of moments of reality. So uh, not knowing or knowing wrongly are, are both ignorance or delusion are both reasons why we practice. Mm -hmm. Way to go. Way to go. <laughs> A long way to go. <laughs> I'm curious, then, I mean, are there, words in, are there words in Vietnamese that are like, that translate differently or make more sense in a different way? Yeah. Or French, or French. <laughs> yeah, ignorance is not knowing. But like, delusion is like um, a deluded mind is a little bit crazy. Yeah, not seeing clearly. Like, I may have like, the delusion that I know everything. So it's different from the ignorance that I don't know anything. <laughs> Illusion is that, oh, I, I know, I know. So it seems that's why right for me, like, deluded and ignorance are different. Mostly I go with the, uh, though there may be qualifications, I just go with their two different, their two terms for more or less the same thing. Re remember that not until one is fully enlightened as an arhant does the last bit of ignorance fall away. Mm -hmm. There's still enough ignorance of that before one is an arhant, even after they've let go of all uh, anger and desire, mm -hmm. there's enough ignorance that there's there's still subtle desire for existence or non-existence. There's still restlessness. There's still conceit. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of, of the remaining ignorance that's there. The remaining moha. Khalil, do you still have a question? Thank you, Michelle. My question is for you. Um, is or how is being equanimous different than being indifferent? Ah, okay. Um, it, this is one of my pet peeves in the spiritual world that people can look like they're equanimous, but they're really indifferent. <laughs> and so I think that um, in terms of the... Uh, the subtleties of the Buddha's teaching. Um, indifference is uh, a heart that is not connected. And in equanimity, the heart is connected. Um, and so that it's incredibly different because in, in I think of, you know, there, I, you know, this is such a big subject. I think it's so important. Um, numbness like being numb is actually an emotion it's like it's it we think of it as sort of a nothingness but actually it's it's a it's a presence of um, not being connected uh, but it can look as we all know um, we we're all good at looking like we're okay right we can all look like we're we're connected we can all look like we're okay but actually we're not even close to being there you know, it's like, actually, if you look at our, you know, way our presence, it's like the the attention is really far away. It's it's not a witnessing with connection. It's um, not there. Do 
Do you see the difference? They're they're incredibly different, but the the Buddha called it. You know, these translations are tricky, but he called indifference the near enemy of equanimity in the Brahma Vihara uh, equanimity. It's like it it's it can seem so much like it, but it really isn't. And any kind of denial, as we all know, denial or passivity, um, numbness, indifference, it's um, the reason why I call it the pet peeve in the spiritual world, because so many people try to look like they're peaceful, but actually they're not, they're not connected with the pain. And that, you know, that's, um, it's so critical for us all to not demonize indifference or to make it bad or wrong. It's, it's more like the heart closes down to protect itself, right? So when somebody's indifferent, ourself or another, it, I always think, that they need the most compassion. They're, they're the most afraid, actually. I remember one time I, um, this is, I, sometimes I'll tell a story and it's funny to me, but it might not sound funny. But when my middle sister died, this neighbor came over for something and he said, how are you, Michelle? But I, I look like I'd been crying. And I said, well, my, not very good. My sister just died. And he went, well, we're all going to die sometime. Too bad. And he kind of, you know how somebody can just kind of pat you on the shoulder. And he went, bye, Michelle, like and left. And I was like, wow, <laughs> that was really not connected, right? He couldn't deal with it. You know, he just disappeared. But then I realized, wow, he couldn't, he couldn't handle it at all, right? So what do we do in these situations, right? Like I would have preferred I would have preferred him to be able, I would have liked to have somebody said, oh, you poor, that's really sad, right? And I know that wasn't, um, he wasn't there. You know, there's a million examples of this. Denial is so pervasive. Um, passivity. You can see naivete is sort of a imbalance of, metta and um, equanimity. It's like naivete is sort of that wishful thinking that we want things to be like we would hope or wish they are. So I always think they're like an imbalance of both. The Buddha also taught that equanimity takes the most wisdom of anything. It requires the, the deepest understanding of how things are. That be, that it's, it's a peace without condition. So it's, it's not a condoning. It's not a condoning of the pain in the world or an agreement. It's not an agreement with the pain in the world. It's, it's very different. It's a deep acceptance of the fact of it, that it is happening. It doesn't mean we don't want to move toward doing something with alleviating suffering or understanding that we can't or can, but it, it is not, um, the peace is not condoning. Very important. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes it's helpful to know the, the definition uh, in, in from the Buddhist Pali language. So the word for equanimity, upeka, means literally to, to look upon or look over, meaning not looking away. Looking away would be a disconnect, would be indifference, would be not caring. Looking over or looking upon evokes a, a serene presence an anchored, peaceful presence that's not reacting. Looks like Kristen has a question. Hi. Um, my question is, is for you, Michelle. And I also want to say how much I appreciate it, uh, appreciate your talk. 
um, today. You know, that, that we need to strengthen ourselves in this time to meet the level of grief that we need to meet. And um, my, my question is kind of related to, to the last one. Uh, I, I find that for quite some time now, when, when I hear or read something that's particularly difficult about um, some horrendous thing that's happened in the world, and my immediate reaction is um, it's a short reaction, but it's, it's judgment, anger, blaming. And then it's like, I can't help but go put myself in the the mind of the person who has, or the people who are committing atrocities. And I just get this uh, incredible sense of peace washing over me. And then at some point, there's this little voice that comes in and says, is this okay? Is it really okay? to be, be, be feeling peaceful in, in the midst of this. So I guess now, my- uh, Knowing how hard you have had to work at this, Kristen, I mean, knowing how much anger you did, <laughs> knowing how much you, anger you have had and how much you've had to work at it and work at it and work at it. I mean, I, I know you really well, I think enough to say, um, this is the fruit of so much, so much practice, so much practice of not shying away from the pain in the world and in your, your young youth and all that you faced. And I think that um, I remember uh, during the last presidency, <laughs> our recent last presidency, how you were sending, you were doing some meta practice for the president. And I was like, whoa, way to go, <laughs> Kristen. I mean, you know, most people were not doing that, but you were like really at it. You know, you've been at this. So I, I don't think there's anything. <laughs> I think it's like you've, it's, you know, you've really an example of someone who does not numb out by any means, but that just has worked at this and 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 cares so deeply. You know, it's a um, very moving and inspiring to me that you can do that and say, and say, is there, is there something, something wrong? Like, is there, you know, is this okay, right? That's the, I think that's the doubt that often comes when we really are peaceful. It's like, I think there are ways in which um, when we've had very glimpses of deep peace, often it's at some point there's this like, the little me comes back and it's like, no, you know, is this, this okay? But I'm not, I don't really think it's that. I think it's just that um, it could be kind of almost um, a surprise. I don't know, is, does it feel surprising that it's so, you're able to do that? Well, it happens so often that it's not a surprise, mostly. But, the, you know, there, there's just still that what is what really does it mean to accept? Because there's so much to, to grieve and so much to accept. Feels, at times it feels overwhelming. Um, when Pardon, I, I didn't hear the last thing you just said. At, at times it, feel, it feels overwhelming when I'm not feeling peaceful. It is, and I think that that's kind of what you're, what you're saying is kind of like what 
that grief, the grief and the, the Buddha's teaching around the overwhelm and the helplessness and then just like being able at some point to have the wherewithal that, that it's not personal. This isn't personal. There are these impersonal spiritual factors that come up, the compassion and then the equanimity and the mindfulness and the, the, that ability to empathize and not... Um, to have the humility to know that if we were in somebody else's shoes, that we might um, be suffering in the same way, you know, that, that to have that humility to empathize in that way and then to accept is, it, again, I, I know it's not happening all day. You're not saying it's happening all day, right? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I would really appreciate that again. That this is again knowing you. This has come after a tremendous amount of practice, and to keep going with it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Be, we all have to be careful of doubt. Of that kind of minimizing or doubting of the, the times when something does arise at peaceful and, and to know that often it's um, it's like uh, the personal might be coming back in at that point. Maybe not, but just you might explore that. Yeah. That Kristen has come back. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did, Quinn, were you trying to raise your hand? Were you trying to? Yeah. Oh, here. That's impressive. I didn't see. Yeah. Can you unmute? Let's see. There we go. This this is in regard to that question about indifference. <laughs> and equanimity. So my question is the neutral feelings that one have, it can either lead to indifference and delusion, or it can also lead to equanimity. Am I correct? Great, yeah. Steve, do you wanna answer that? That's so good, yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. Keeping in mind that um, every moment there's the possibility of neutral, pleasant, or unpleasant. It's happening all the time. And um, it, usually the one in delusion, their neutral feeling tone is connected to indifference or disconnection distraction and so forth. Uh, but the equanimity established from our practice is, is the, has a neutral feeling tone, but it's the neutral feeling tone that's just not reactive. It's just at peace, it's at ease, it's true balance, mental equipoise, you know, right through to the core, you just feel this, the mind isn't perturbed. It can be in the presence of a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of dukkha. Uh, but that non-reactivity allows us to do whatever we can, which might be just being present, being still, or to some compassionate action, some compassionate kind word that, that comes out of that that equanimous, neutral, abiding. Yeah, I, yeah it, it, that's so important. I think in relationship to Kristen and Khalil, um, Quinn, I, I think um, sometimes it's unfamiliar to us to be that peaceful, right? It's like, again, you've been exploring that 
completely. And I, I'm hoping that you can see that maybe there's some unfamiliarity with it, but that it's actually deep and pure. Is that possible? There is that doubt. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, yeah. Yeah, that there's in the face of such suffering that one one can have that peace. I think again that sometimes we'll doubt that that's okay, like Kristen's saying, and it's deeply okay. Connected and a connected free awareness is extraordinary. <laughs> Kind. Well, may we all get through the next week. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Let's. Uh, it's really we we need each other. We need to part of the um, practice is really knowing that we need to really be helping each other through this time. That's why we meet here every Sunday. Yeah. Okay. See you next Sunday, I hope.